Hey everyone, thank you so much for joining in for today's talk. And our prayer is today that this talk will encourage you and that God will speak to you through it. And I do wanna say, you gotta to subscribe to this YouTube channel right now if you wanna see more stuff like this, all the latest content coming out. And also, don't forget, check out our website, myhopecity.cc and connect with us on Facebook by liking our page, Hope City Efton, and joining our Facebook groups. Again, thank you so much for joining us and I can't wait to see how God is gonna to speak to you through this talk. Hello, Hope City. I want to welcome you to church today. My name is Ryan, and I have the privilege of working here on staff with the team here at Hope City. And I want to welcome you to church today. I want to thank you for making it possible as we can be one church gathered in many rooms across our city and region. Maybe you're in an in-person watch party in this room this weekend. We welcome you. We are so excited that you have decided to take even just an hour out of your day to enjoy and be the church with us today. I've been privileged and given the opportunity to bring the word here today, and I am so excited to share what God has laid on my heart. Um, and if you were to give a topic, a theme, or a title for today's word, it's this. Freedom in the following. We're going to talk about what it means to experience the freedom that Jesus has freely given us, and what it means to experience it through following him. We're going to talk about what it means to truly follow Jesus. What does it mean to be a disciple of Christ and to walk with him each and every day of our lives? So we're going to jump into it, but right now before we do, I want you to take a minute. Maybe you're in person here today. I want you to look to the person beside you if you're online. If you're in a room, your living room or bedroom, look to the person beside you or type in the chat, God speak now, as we prepare our hearts, that God has a transformation that he wants to do in our hearts as we open ourselves to be a part of it. I want to open with a scripture found in Mark chapter 1, verses 16 to 20, and it's entitled, Jesus Calls His First Disciples. It says, as Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. When he had gone a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat, preparing their nets. Without delay, he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. God, Lord, right now I thank you that you have given us the privilege and the opportunity to be your church. That regardless the season, regardless what we're facing, whether in one room together or we're in many rooms, Lord, your church is on the move. I thank you, God, that you have blessed us, Lord, to hear from your word today. I pray, God, that right now that you would open our hearts, that you would open our ears to hear from you. God, that in this moment that I would stop and that you would start. Transform us with your word today. May we follow you. We ask this in your holy and precious name. Amen. You notice the scripture we just read. When Jesus calls his disciples, there is a fervency and a without delay. And immediately they follow Christ. They drop everything and they follow him. I have a couple thoughts I want to share with you today. And the first one is this. When we experience the freedom in following Christ, following comes first. Following must come first. And in Jesus's life and during his ministry, his three years where he traveled and he proclaimed the good news and he healed people and there was miracles seen. While Jesus was walking, he made it very clear that following him was not a hobby. It wasn't just a good pastime or something that we can put on our resume or something that, oh yeah, I go to church a couple times a year. Or I, I give the, myself the title of Christian in the hopes that people may look at me better Jesus made it extremely clear that in following him, it is the all-encompassing purpose of our lives. And there is no greater life than following him with all that we are. We're going to read a couple examples in scripture during Jesus' ministry of what it meant when people came to him, they would have heard the good news that he was sharing. They heard the gospel. They saw the miracles that he was performing, and they came to him. And Jesus revealed their hearts, and he showed them the cost of what it meant to follow him. I have a couple examples. The first one is found in Mark chapter 10, verse 21, 
And we know the story, the rich young ruler. This young man comes to Jesus, probably hearing the good news he was sharing and seeing what Jesus was doing. And he runs up to him and he says, Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, he lists off some of the the commandments. He says, obey the law, do this and do that. And he says, Jesus, I've done this since I was a young boy. And we pick up the story here in verse 21. It says, Jesus looked at him and loved him. That's extremely important. I want you to know Jesus loves every single person in the world. Jesus didn't look at this man. He didn't look at him with frustration. He didn't look at him with anger. He didn't look at him in spite. It says Jesus looked at him and loved him. This shows the heart behind what Jesus is about to say. But he says, one thing you lack, Jesus said, go sell everything you have and give it to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. We see in Matthew chapter 8 verses 21 to 22, another disciple said to him, Lord first let me go and bury my father. But Jesus told him, follow me and let the dead bury their own dead. This seems pretty intense. This seems pretty deep. Like man, this person comes to you and Jesus is just saying as it is. We see again in Luke chapter 9 verses 61 to 62, still another said, I will follow you Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. Jesus replied, no one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the service of the kingdom of God. We read scriptures like this and think, man, God has no compassion on these people. Why is he so ruthless in his responses? Jesus is not being ruthless or uncompassionate to these people. Jesus, the takeaway from these scriptures is not, oh, I have to um, not say goodbye to my loved ones. I can't own any nice things and still follow Jesus. Or I can't go to funerals for my lost ones. Jesus isn't saying that. But you see, what Jesus did during his ministry and what he still does today is Jesus sees the heart of people. Jesus sees the heart of people. He hears what we say, but he knows what's what's in our hearts. He knows what's truly within us. And the common denominator between all three of these stories is that when Jesus evaluated their heart, he saw the but first. That Jesus, I'll follow you. Jesus, I'll go where you go. I want to be a part of what you're doing. But first, let me go and do this. But first, let me take care of this. Jesus sees what's in our hearts. And he says, come follow me. But if we are going to follow Jesus, we need to know that following him must come first. That there can be no other but first in our lives but Jesus. Oswald Chambers, a theologian, has a quote, and he says this, The reason some of us are such poor specimens of Christianity is because we have no almighty Christ. We have Christian attributes and experiences, but there is no abandonment to Jesus Christ. Church, we need an attitude of abandonment to Jesus Christ. That nothing else matters in this world, and I don't care what the culture thinks. I don't care what people will say about me. I don't care what I'm missing out on, because when I follow Jesus, I have all that I need. And as long as he's first, he will never lead me astray. We need this abandonment, this fervency, to drop everything like the disciples did, and to follow Jesus into the unknown. There's a story I want to share with you um, of a man who lived during the 1800s, and this story took place in the 1850s time. This man's name was Charles Blondin. And Charles Blondin, he was a professional acrobat, but since he was a young boy, he favored the tightrope. He loved the tightrope. He had done it since he was a child, and he grew up, and he had done it professionally. But there came a time in his life where he said, I am going to do the best stunt I have ever done. And this is what he did. He said, I am going to tightrope across Niagara Falls. In case you've never been to Niagara Falls before, I've been able to be there once. But Niagara Falls is 1,300 feet across and 1,100 feet above the raging waves down below. And he's like, yeah, I'll put a two-inch rope across and I'm going to walk across it. So he travels to Niagara Falls and he does it. Not only does he do it, but every two weeks, he says, I am going to come back 
and the crowds grew bigger and bigger. And he says, every single time I come back, I'm going to do something more creative, more intense to make the stunt better than ever before. Maybe not for me. I'm not a big fan of heights. I always tell my wife, I'm not afraid of heights. I'm just afraid of falling from them. Um, She doesn't really see through that. But he gets there and he arrives and he walks across and he's doing these crazy stunts. And one week in particular, he shows up and he has the tightrope all made up. And he grabs a wheelbarrow. And he grabs a wheelbarrow and he fills it full of heavy rocks. And he picks it up and he begins his trek across the tightrope, the 1,300 foot journey. And he walks across and he walks back. And when he gets back, he empties the wheelbarrow that is full of rocks. Everybody's cheering. At this day, he had been doing it over and over. The crowds were growing. It was recorded that over 25,000 people came to watch. And all of these people came to watch this miraculous Charles Blondine, and he gets across and he empties the wheelbarrow and he looks to the crowd and he says, how many of you believe that I could walk across and back on the tightrope with the wheelbarrow, but not rocks in the wheelbarrow, but with a person inside? And the crowd had never been louder. They cheered. They said, not only is this man going to walk across himself, but he is going to bring another person, another person's life, and walk across, and they were cheering and going crazy. If you were to ask anyone, you would know that nobody there didn't believe that he could do it based on their response. But his following, his following statement didn't have the same effect, because he looked at the same crowd, and he said, who's going to get in the wheelbarrow? There was a pin drop. 25,000 people within an instant, went from believing there is no way this man can't do it. We've seen him do stunt after stunt after stunt, week after week. But the moment you ask me to get in, there's no way. We need church, an abandonment to Christ, an abandonment to say, I don't care about anything else in this world. Christ is going to be first. And when we follow him, yes, it's going to be scary. Yes, it might be into the unknown. But God will never lead us astray, and he will lead us to the place where he wants us to be. You know what else this story teaches me? We are not called to be fans of Jesus. We're not called to be fans of Christ. We're called to be followers of Jesus. You see, Jesus doesn't call us to stand off to the side, to stand in the crowd with the many, and to say, yeah, Jesus, go, do your thing, continue moving. Jesus was on this earth for only 33 years, estimatedly three years of ministry. But do you know what he did? He called disciples. He said, you come follow me. Watch how I live life. Watch how I serve. Watch how I live for other people and sacrifice myself for the kingdom. Watch it. Because there is going to come a time that when Jesus died and rose again, he met with his disciples and says, I cannot stay, for if I stay, then the, the, the Holy Spirit can't come and work within you to do the work I've called you to do. That Jesus didn't call his disciples to just be his fan club and walk around and say, go Jesus, look at all the cool things I'm doing. He's called us to get in to the work with him, to be a part, to follow, to live as he lived, to work as he worked, to serve as he served. John 15, 15 says, I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends for everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. Jesus has welcomed us into his kingdom. He's welcomed us into the master's business, not to stand off to the side, but to look to him, to say, God, how can you use me? I want to be a part of your business. I want to be a part of the kingdom's work. And it will happen when we follow him and when we put him first. To experience the freedom in following Christ, following comes first, and following leads to surrendered servanthood. Now, there's two angles that I want to look at in that. I want to look at the servanthood, and I want to look at the surrender. They come directly together, but I want to look at the two of them. We're going to start with servanthood in John 12, 
verse 26, it says, Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant also will be. My Father will honor the one who serves me. Jesus has called us to follow him, not to be his fan, to follow him, to walk in his ways. And in so doing and following him, we are going to walk in his ways. We're going to live as he lived. We're going to love as he loved. We're going to serve as he served. We're going to sacrifice as he sacrificed, surrender as he surrendered. We see his heart in Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 to 8. It says, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant. Being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. You see, our freedom is found in the art of of servanthood. Our freedom is found in the art of servanthood. To say, yes, Jesus, I'll follow you, but how may I serve you? Now, there's a paradox here that I want to get clear. We don't serve to get freedom from Christ. We serve because Christ has set us free. I'm going to say that again. We don't serve to get freedom from Christ. We serve because it is Christ who has set us free, that we look to Jesus and say, I know that there's no way that I can repay you. I know that there's no way that I can earn your grace, your mercy, and your love. But because of the great work that you've done in me, I will look to you and say, Jesus, I will follow you. I will surrender and serve you however you see fit. And Jesus isn't bossing us around to say, do it. Jesus says, no, do it as I did it. Follow me. He's the first one that his mindset was to humble himself so that we too may humble ourselves and live for him. And when we experience the freedom of following Christ, when we experience the freedom that comes with putting him first and humbling ourselves, our desires begin to shift. We begin to look, God, what is pleasing to you? God, how may I serve you better? God, how may I build your kingdom? How may I be used by you more? Galatians chapter 5 verse 13 says, you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. Christ has set us free. But do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. This is when we come to the place in our hearts where we say, God, what pleases you? Have you ever asked, God, what pleases you? I don't want to live my life for you. I don't want to live in relationship with you just to see what I can get from God. But no, Lord, how can I serve you? How can I serve one another? How can I build up the kingdom. We are to humble ourselves as Christ first humbled ourselves. We're to be his servant. The other angle I want to look at at this is surrender. As following leads to surrendered servanthood. You see, we're called to humble ourselves in more ways than God. How can you use me when we follow Christ? Jesus displayed it in the way he lived his life again, but when we surrender, there's multiple things in our life we're going to have to surrender. We're called to surrender our pride. We're called to surrender our preferences. We're called to surrender our comfortability. We're called to surrender our conditions. We're called to surrender our control. We're called to surrender some of the outcomes of situations that we want to hold tight to. We're called to surrender these things. To say life with Jesus is so much greater than to worry about everything yourself, but we have a God in heaven that we can trust and give our worries, to give every situation to. We're called to surrender them to him. We see this in another encounter that Jesus has with a follower of him that comes to him in Matthew chapter 8, verses 19 to 20. It says, then a teacher of the law came. I want you to get that. A teacher of the law came. Someone who knew the old scriptures comes to Jesus and he said this, teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. That's a bold statement. I don't want to just highlight over that. I will follow you wherever you go. Is the boldest statement you can say as a Christian. But he says, teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus replied, 
Foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. We are called to follow Jesus into the unknown. But whatever the cost is, it's worth it because there's no greater life. But Jesus looked to this religious leader. He looked to the teacher of the law. And sometimes we come to Jesus maybe seeking Christian attributes, maybe seeking a spiritual experience. But Jesus looks to our heart. And when we say, Jesus, I'll follow you wherever you go, we better mean it. We can't be caught up in the moment of, oh, this feels good, so I'm going to say it. Because Jesus responded and said, bro, I'm homeless. I've got nowhere to sleep tonight. It's raining. I'm going to be wet. We might not eat tomorrow. Are you coming? Are you jumping in the wheelbarrow? We're called to surrender the things of this world. And it's because when we follow the Savior who is not confined to the ways of this world, we experience a freedom that is so much greater than anything this world can offer. That when you experience it, when you live in it through following Jesus every day of your life, not having some spiritual high moment, but each and every day looking to Christ, when you look to the things of this world, You'll never want to go back. You will want to press on through whatever may come in order that you may be behind Jesus. We need to be careful. Are we ready to say, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go? Like this teacher of the law said. You see, God doesn't look for lip service. He looks for life service. There's a lot of promises we can make with our lips that when push comes to shove, it's a lot harder to live out in our life. And Jesus isn't calling us to say a lot of religious things and spiritual things. Jesus wants us in the everyday, mundane, ordinary activities of life. Are we going to follow him? Are we going to trust in him? Are we going to seek him? That whatever comes, I'll surrender and I'll look to serve. Following comes first. Following leads to surrendered servanthood. My last thought here today is following God brings him glory. Our sole purpose in life is to bring God glory glory. A lot of people get statements like that confused, and I'll be honest, I had that statement confused for a majority of my life. To bring God glory, I thought I would categorize, okay, so God is in the spiritual box of my life, so I need to do all of the spiritual things to fill that box in order that when it fills up, that then God is glorified. Then God is exalted in my life. But you see, a light needed to turn on. God needed to open my eyes to realize that God doesn't want me to just do things for him. That I come to him with the vending machine, that if I deposit enough prayer, if I deposit enough Bible study, if I deposit enough nice things to say to my parents and friends, if I'm a good enough Christian, then check, 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 God's glorified in my life. That's one of the most emptying lives you can live. It wasn't until in my life that I realized God wants me. And I want to tell you today, God wants you. You may have grown up in church or maybe you've had some sort of church background, maybe none at all, but all you've ever thought of of church and Christianity is the religious checklist That if I can get it all done, then God will be happy with me. Then he'll check it off. That one's good. God looks at you as his prized possession, his child. And he wants you. He wants relationship with you. Don't subcategorize glorifying God in your life with only the spiritual things that I do. But look to God and to say, it doesn't matter what I do. I don't work for human masters. I work for the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And all that I do, I do for him. And nothing and no one else. When we look to him, when we seek God's face, when we surrender to him, when we follow him, 
when we seek to serve him with our whole hearts, God is glorified. There was a quote that completely changed my life when I read it. For the first time, and it's a short quote, the simplest quote, but I want it to sit with you. It's from John Piper, and he says, God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. I just want that to sit. I just want that to rest on your mind and your heart for a second. It still gives me goosebumps when I read it. God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. This is my takeaway quote. God's joy is made complete when our complete joy is found in him. That was so countercultural to my, my mindset, my whole life, my mentality, my whole life. That instead of subcategorizing all the spiritual things I had to do to please God, I realized, no, God wants me. God wants relationship with me. God wants to be with me in everything that I do. That in everything I seek to bring him glory. I seek to, I seek to praise him. I seek to worship him. I seek to have him at the center of my life. That's all he wants. When I'm satisfied in him, because he's given me everything. I don't need to go and put deposits of prayer and all these good righteous things in to get something from God because I am most satisfied in God because I've realized that God has given me everything that I need. He's given you everything that you need. God calls us to be satisfied in him and it's when we rest in him he is most glorified. Psalm Chapter 115, verse 1 says, Not to us, Lord, not to us, but to your name be the glory because of your love and faithfulness. You see, our life is not to be lived for ourselves. Our life is not to see how much I can get out of it. If I live to be 70, 80, 90 years old, Scripture says that life is but a vapor. I'm here one moment and gone the next. It's not about what I can get out of it. It's what I can pour into the kingdom of God while I'm here. If you wonder why every time I go to the Bible, it's not talking about all the great things that I personally can get in life. It's because God has something greater planned for you. He is a purpose greater than anything you can find in this life or in this world. It's found in him. It's not for us. It's to bring him glory. John Chapter 3, verse 30, this is John the Baptist who prepared the way for Jesus. People looked at him and said, are you the Messiah? And he says, no, I'm not worthy to untie the sandals of the one who comes before me. This is what he says, he must become greater, I must become less. This needs to be our prayer, church, that God in my life, may it be you who's glorified, may it be you who's praised, may it be you who's lifted up, that when people look at me, they don't see me, but they see you, that I would be your hands and feet for the kingdom of God, that I would be a co-worker for you, seeking to see your kingdom come and will be done. Living is not for us. It's for what we can be for God. How can we be a part? When we follow Jesus, it's for God's glory. It's not for our glory. In church, I like to think I'm not alone when I say that we're guilty of pursuing a self-gratifying and ulterior motive relationship with God or spiritual life. That God, what can I get from you? God, if I give, and we might not even intentionally do it, but we think, man, I've served in a lot of areas of the church this week. I spent a lot of extra time in prayer today. Man, I finished two extra plans on the Bible app this week than I normally do. What am I, I wonder what blessing is coming my way. I wonder what breakthrough is coming my way. But you see, church, our hearts, our minds, there needs to be a shift. There needs to be a change. We live in a selfish generation, a selfish culture of me, 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 what can I get? And our natural sinful nature is pulling us to what we want. But when we experience the freedom in following Christ, yes, it's difficult. Yes, it's not always easy. Yes, it's not always focused on me. But we experience the fullness of life when we can't help but look to God and say, 
God, let your kingdom come. Let your will be done in my life as it is in heaven. May you become more. May I become less. We look to him and say, God, I need you to change me. I need you to change my heart. I need you to change my mind. I need you to change the way I live my life. That it's not for me. That it's for his glory. That it's for his purpose. That it's for his desires. That it's for his plan to be done. And he desires to use his church. He desires to use his people. First Peter chapter 2, verse 9 says, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. I want to highlight a line there. We're God's chosen people. We're his royal priesthood. We are God's special possession. What's our purpose? That you may declare the praises of him who called you. It's not about us. It's not about what I can get. It's not about who I am. It's about who God is making me. And it's about who God has called me to become. It's about how I can glorify his name, how I can be a part of glorifying him in every single day of my life through experiencing and living out the freedom in following Christ every day in the mundane, ordinary situations of our lives. We bring glory to God. Right now, I want to pray. I want to pray for the church. If you're watching online or Maybe you're in this, in this room for our in-person watch party and you say, I'm a Christian. I follow Jesus. I'm a part of his church. I want to pray right now that God would begin to move, would begin to stir in our hearts, would begin to stir in our minds to begin seeking how we can glorify him and him alone, how his praise will always be on our lips how his purpose and his plan and his desires are ever increasing in our lives, that there would be less of us and more of him. Church, let's pray. God, I pray, Lord, for every part of the body of your church, God, I pray for every Christian, every person who follows you, Lord, I pray right now, God, that you would fill us with a deeper desire to see your kingdom come, to see your will be done. Lord, to see you be magnified and glorified in our lives. That it's not about us, that it's not about what we can get from you. Lord, that we don't serve you to get freedom. Lord, we serve you because we are free. God, I pray that you would use us for your kingdom, for your purpose, for your desires. Lord, that there would be less of us and more of you. God, have your way in your church. God, and I believe that as a generation, as a church that pursues your ways, that pursues your will above all else, who put you first, who surrender, who serve and seek to glorify you, God, you will begin a work that we could never imagine being a part of within us. God, let it be done in your name, Jesus. And right now, church, I want to pray. Maybe you're watching. Maybe a friend or a family member has just been sharing this on their Facebook page and you're checking in for the first time or maybe you've been joining us for a while. And you say, I, I haven't given my life to Jesus. I'm not a follower of Christ. And you say, I've chased the things of this world. I've tried to find my value, my purpose in relationships. In all these situations, all these areas, I've tried to find my value and I've left empty. That's because there's a God-shaped hole in your heart that Scripture says that God has placed eternity in the hearts of all men. Seeking that no one should perish, but that would, we would have eternal life. And I believe that there's someone watching today that you're watching and you're saying, I need to change in my life. I need to give my life to Christ. Everywhere I've looked, everywhere I've tried to follow, I've left empty. I promise you when you follow Jesus, you will experience his freedom and that no matter what comes your way, he will never leave you and never forsake you. What does it mean 
to accept Christ as your Savior. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 to 10 says, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. We're not saved by our own merit, but what we can do, if I can earn God's grace and his salvation, and I am so thankful that there's nothing I could do to earn eternal life with Christ. But God sent his son and Jesus came and lived a perfect life and died the sinner's death that you and I deserve so that we might have life in all its fullness in him. Oswald Chambers says it this way, the redemption of Christ is not an experience. It is the great act of God which he has performed through Christ. And I have to build my faith on it. God has given us the gift of faith. There's nothing we could do to earn or deserve it. His grace and faith has been outreached to us, has been given to us. There's nothing we could do. And he gives it as a free gift. And it's not an experience. It's not something I just get goosebumps and I feel really good and then, oh, I don't know where that moment went. Life with Christ is so much more than a moment. It is the act of God and nothing and no one can change it. That when we accept the gift of faith that he's given us, we build our lives on it. You say, Ryan, I need Jesus. How do I give my life to Christ? Romans 10 verse 9 says, If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. I'm going to lead us in a prayer, and I just want to be very clear. Scripture doesn't say that you're saved by repeating the prayer after the pastor on the platform or saying a couple words. We just read what it means. This is a hard thing between you and God that right now in this moment, God is reaching out and he's saying, follow me and you will experience freedom you could find nowhere else. I'm gonna lead us in a prayer and if that's you, I encourage you to pray along. Anything like this in your own words or repeat after me, but pray it from your heart between you and Jesus. Dear Jesus, God, I thank you for your love, for your grace, for your mercy on my life. I thank you that though I was dead in my sin, Lord, through all the times I've failed and I've faltered, you extend your grace to me. Lord, come into my life. Forgive me of my sins. God, and lead me all the days of my life as I follow you. Amen. Well, church... If you prayed that prayer, we are so excited. We prayed alongside of you, and we welcome you to the family and the body of Christ. You are not called to do this life alone in this newfound faith journey, and we would love to connect with you. You can take out your phone. You can text the words, I prayed that prayer, to the number popping up on the screen, 506 300 3097, and we would love to reach you there and to walk with you in this newfound relationship with Christ. Well, church, thank you for gathering today to be one church in many rooms today. This week, let's follow Christ, let's live in his freedom, and let's bring him glory. I hope today's talk was encouraging to you, and hey, we would love to hear from you of how God spoke to you through this talk, and again, you can message us on Facebook. Make sure to like and follow us while you're there. Hope City F10. You can reach out on our website, myhopecity.cc. And don't forget, subscribe to this YouTube channel so you can stay up to date with all the content coming out. And we are excited to see how God is going to continually move through your life through this. Love you guys. Have a great day.